Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, November 6th, and this is the weekly market wrap or update. So anything you see or hear on this video or here on the podcast is not to be taken as investment advice. This is for informational purposes only. I am not a registered financial advisor. I am not authorized to give you personal investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. And remember, I'm just a guy on the internet. It's your money, it's your responsibility. So I wanted to talk a little bit uh, starting this week about energy again. Um, we're kind of in a lull around oil. Why? We're in the shoulder season between the summer driving season, the vacation season, the construction season and entering the fall and winter when uh, heating oil demand and distillate demand will pick up. And so what happens is you have refineries going into turnaround season. And what does that mean? Well, in the refinery, we would uh, we have various units inside the refinery that do make different products. Or if you're in a very large refinery, if you have a catal catalytic or cat crackers, which uh, break down the hydrocarbon chains or you have SRUs and you have upgraders or all kinds of different crude units or product units. So these things require maintenance. And during the times of lower demand or when you're transitioning in demand of different products, the refineries will go through turnaround season and they'll bring contractors in and they will, um, they will do maintenance and upgrades and replace things that need to be fixed and all kinds of things. So we're seeing the crude price be a little bit weak recently. We've also had some noise that we're going to have a coordinated, possibly strategic petroleum release. We've seen these before. It's not going to solve the problem. It could potentially knock the price down for you know a small period of time. But the problem is, is the relentless demand, the return of the demand to pre-pandemic levels and the ongoing demand increases for petroleum products as economies recover and continue growing. Um, as I reported, I think last week, we are seeing diesel demand and gasoline demand are exceeding pre-pandemic levels in several countries like India, China, for example. But the first thing I want to get into is uh, we'll talk a lot about crude and oil further on in the presentation. But the first thing I want to talk about is the big news that China came out with. Again, I mean, it's been like, I don't know, it seems like four to six straight weeks of really super great positive news for uranium. It just keeps getting better and better, right? And so China um, announced this week, and I'll put a link to the article. I'll try to link as many of the articles as I can in the show notes. China has announced they're going to build, uh, they're going to add 150 uh, basically large reactors by 2035. 150 reactors by 2035. That'll be more reactors that have been built than the last like 40 years. And this is like, uh, you know, 14 years. This is nothing in nuclear years, right? And so what does the article say? The world's biggest emitter, talking about CO2, obviously, China, planning at least 150 new reactors in the next 15 years, more than the rest of the world has built in the past 35 years. The effort could cost as much as $440 billion. As early as the middle of this decade, the country will surpass the US as the world's largest generator of nuclear power. And so I'll put a, uh, that was from the article. And then I, uh, there was a Twitter uh, exchange between John Quakes, who, if you're in uranium, you know that he's probably the informational yeoman of the uranium sector. He catalogs and publishes just about all the news that comes out um, on nuclear and uranium for several years now that I've known him or known of him. And his following's pretty pretty big now. Him, him and Kevin Bambro, who's a former executive at Sprott, who's on Twitter and is very plugged in, they ha kind of had an exchange, which I'll put a link uh, to the Twitter exchange, and they kind of just penciled in what that means for uranium demand. So assume 500,000 pounds per gigawatt and three times uh, that, which would be 1.5 million for the initial core loads, because when you build a new reactor, 
you have to uh, put three times the the uh, the consumption in the, as you initially load out the reactor, and so basically 100 additional reactors by 2035 would be over 50 million pounds a year of unanticipated consumption, adding another three Cigar Lake mines required just for China, the equivalent of three Cigar Lake mines. And, you know, like I said before, and I've mentioned several times before, you see no news of anybody contemplating I mean, I ha we don't know of anyone building a new uranium mine or a major uranium mine, and we certainly haven't even heard of it or even anyone contemplating it. Um, as I have said before, there is plenty of uranium in the ground. There's not, we're not gonna run out of uranium. The problem is, is that you can't just snap your fingers or call up India or go on Upwork and have somebody code up a uranium mine. It takes years of permitting, preparation, drilling, getting financing, building the mine, operating the mine, everybody trying to wreck the whole project all the way through. You've run into all kinds of problems. And where are you going to build a new uranium mine nowadays? In Canada, in the United States, you know, you start running into First Nations issues. People don't want, uh, we saw that uh, in uh, through the Navajo Nation. They canceled or, or did not want any uranium even drilling or exploration on their land. So you constantly have, you know, a big uh, pushback anytime you start talking about nuclear power. But the Chinese are in a unique advantage, I think, than a lot of other countries. Why? Uh, the things that we perceive to be negative about them, this is an advantage for them when it comes to doing this. The CCP uh, controls everything. There is no dissent. There is no uh, compromising. There is no four and two year election cycle. They determine that they're going to do something. It's decided and then it happens. And um, there's no multiple people working on it. They pick one design, they do it. They're gonna go out and get the fuel. If they have to go buy mines in Africa or wherever, they're not going to just build the plants and not have already stockpiled the material. So I would suggest this is just another big tailwind. I mean, three Cigar Lake mines. I mean, the annual demand right now is somewhere around 180 million pounds a year of uranium to fuel the current world fleet. And you're talking about China increasing its fleet sufficient to add an additional 33% of world demand unanticipated. So this, this doesn't even take into account what all the other countries around the world are gonna be doing. India, Russia, Japan, uh, and eventually Europe and the United States as you know, it's becoming more and more uh, the zeitgeist, if you will, that nuclear power is going to be the solution or a major part of the solution to excessive CO2. Um, that just, you, you just see the hand running down the wall. That's where the powers that be, that's where the masters of the universe appear to be taking us. So yes, there'll be renewables. Yes, there'll be continued oil and gas, but nuclear power is definitely getting a bid. And we've been reporting on that. We've been talking about it. So like I said, this is just more good news. This is, um, like I said, the Chinese are not just going to go out and spend half a trillion dollars doing this and not secure their fuel supply. They're going to make sure they have sufficient fuel to to build this out and to fuel these reactors. So uh, I'll put a link to the these art this article in this Twitter exchange. You can go back and look at it yourself. But this is just more positive news, and we have more. Uh, Sprott to acquire Northern Uranium ETF. So, uh, you know, Sprott already has the, we already know and have discussed many times, and we've seen the effect of the uranium trust that's buying physical uranium. And so Sprott, you know, is an asset management company. It's based in Canada. It has quite a bit of experience in natural resources. So you knew this was coming, something similar to this. Start buying the uranium, then create a vehicle, or in this case, take over a vehicle, if you will. It's already in effect. It's probably one of the more popular ETFs for uranium miners. And then, uh, you know, if you look at the holdings of the of the northern uranium 
uh, ETF, you will see that about, I think, seven or eight percent of the holdings are the Sprott Uranium Trust. So you, you, you kind of create an even more of a flywheel effect. But anyways, the press release says, Sprott announced today that Sprott Asset Management has entered into a definitive agreement with North Shore Indices to acquire an exclusive license to use the North Shore Global Uranium Mining Index, the performance of which the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, a series of exchange traded trusts, seeks to track. This is a quote from uh, Sprott Asset Management uh, Executive CEO John uh, Campaglia. We believe we are in the early stages of a uranium bull market, and URNM is a perfect complement to the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust, which is the world's largest physical uranium fund. URNM is the only US listed pure play uranium equities ETF, and we look forward to providing investors with two compelling options to invest in the sector. And so Sprott will be, I'm sure, uh, selling this, making their uh, investors aware, the 250 or 300,000 uh, investors, uh, people that they manage money for, high net worth individuals, uh, family offices, what have you, they will, the, the Sprott marketing machine will get behind this. And so you see uh, additional fund flows, you see what's happening. Um, I'm asked all the time, you know, why do I not? I, I don't have to do anything. I, I bought my shares a long time ago at very, very lower prices. Let's put it this way. And so you just have to sit and wait. Now the, you know, the hardest thing to do uh, is to sit and wait for things to happen. And so they're happening. You just need to sit. Um, for the people that are coming in late, and I know you're out there because I get those emails from people that have angst or FOMO. Have I missed it? What should I do? Look, I can't give you personal investment advice, but I will approach the question with an answer like this. If I was not invested in any uranium equities at this point, what would I do? Well, what I would do is probably start dollar cost averaging or buy an initial position into like this Sprott or, or to the uranium ETF, uh, the North Shore, the URNM. You know, let's say you have 10 units you're going to invest, say they're $1,000 each, $10,000 each, whatever, you know, go in and take an initial position of 20% of your money and put it into the ETF. Then, uh, I mean, tomorrow and just get that, relieve that FOMO pressure, okay, regardless of what the price is. Don't try to time it, just buy it. And then, you know, be doing your research, you know, keep adding on regular intervals during pullbacks. You can get a simple charting charting software. And as the thing dips down towards the 50 or 200 day moving averages, uh, you should be adding on those dips. Buy the dip is what you do in a, in a bull market. And then another thing you could do based on how, um, how much risk tolerance you have and how much uh, you, your, your assessment of your risk tolerance and your ability to do the work, you could conceivably take, you know, 25, 30, 40 percent, 50 percent of your of your uranium uh, allotment funds for a uranium allotment and get into very more speculative, if you will, uh, names. You could go out and buy a basket of five or six juniors, developers, explorers and uh, do some crap shooting and, and go for the big time. But I can't tell you what to do. Uh, I will tell you that I don't believe that this bull market in uranium is over. I think it's just gotten started. I've said that before. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of money has been made already by the folks that have got in early. Uh, I was talking two or three years ago when you could have buy things for giveaway prices. Th those days are over. But I believe that uh, over the next 18 to 24 months, um, you are going to uh, probably see a, a uranium price that's substantially higher. And um, that's uh, just for all the reasons we've talked about. I don't need to rehash it. Uh, if you've been listening to this channel, you know the uranium thesis. So like I said, the news, it seems like every week, just another you know, material news item that's positive for uranium comes out. So am I all in on uranium? No, but it's a substantial portion of my portfolio, probably 25%. Uh, I feel strongly about it, but uh, you, you I don't go all in. That's crazy. I, I, I'm diversified uh, into other um, sectors, if you will. So that's my feeling on this. But uh, hey, this is uh, 
this is just more good news, right? And Sprott is a marketing machine. They will like to, they make their money by getting assets under management and get fees on that. And they are, uh, they've now partnered their, they, uh, two for here, you have the, the physical uranium trust. And then uh, for, I'm sure they'll be marketing that to folks. And then uh, saying for the more speculative for people that, you know, when they're talking to their financial advisor, wants some more push in their portfolio, so to speak, to steer them towards the ETF uh, where, uh, you know, for more uh, alpha. So uh, we talked about this when I first started here, the, uh, the, the, this week's news, the SPR release will not solve higher oil price issues. So U.S. Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm said on Wednesday that tapping the country's emergency oil stash is being mauled by the administration to cool gasoline prices that have hit seven-year highs on higher demand as the pandemic eases, according to a Financial Times report. U.S. presidents have occasionally released crude from the reserve to calm oil prices. In the last big release, former President Obama in 2011 ordered the sale of 30 million barrels in response to crude supply disruptions in Libya. That was coordinated with other countries in the International Energy Agency, which also released 30 million barrels. I think I read in the article that it affected oil prices by temporarily lowering them by $4 a barrel for like a period of a few weeks. Look, there's nothing the government can do. The only thing they can do is reverse the ridiculous policies that they've already uh, implemented um, that have sent messages to the oil and gas industry, at least in the, in the U.S., that they're persona non grata. You know, get the Keystone Pipeline open back up. Um, bring all of the major oil producing independents and large oil companies that have holdings and are that have properties in the Permian and in the various oil fields and tell them, hey, we want you to, you know, let's do our duty here and we're going to back you. We're going to get behind you. Yes, we need to think about the long term. They could couch it that way, but they're not going to do that. This is all they're committed. They're, they're sold out fully this administration to the progressive wing. They're just not going to do it. So they're trying to do two things at once. They're over in Scotland talking about um, climate change and lowering CO2 and energy transitions. In the meantime, trying to jawbone OPEC plus Russia and, you know, talk nasty about uh, their domestic oil producers, but yet beg them to increase production. It's stupid. It's not going to work. OK, and this is a temporary fix trying to manipulate the market, something similar that China tried recently. Uh, releasing a bunch of oil from their reserve, you end up having to buy it back at higher prices. That's what ends up happening. And so here's the problem, right? Um, oil demand to hit 103 million barrels in 2022. That's next year, folks. This will be a new all-time high. I told you this was going to happen. And uh, this is going to be relentless. If you, The only thing that keeps the oil demand from growing is if we have some like worldwide recession, which is Anything's possible, right, uh, at this point in time. But right now, the forecasts are for continued economic growth, and that requires energy. And the primary energy sources are hydrocarbons. Sorry, not sorry. That's the way it is. And, um, you know, if we're, we've demonized fossil fuels, we've, we've made them persona non grata, and yet we need them. Uh, it's ridiculous. You've burned your house down because it's haunted, but oh, by the way, winter's setting in. It's crazy. So um, this is where we're at. So CFR, CFO Murray Anschloss forecasts a recovery in oil demand to pre-pandemic levels sometime in 2022. I believe this was uh, CFO of BP saying demand of 100 million barrels per day had already been reached and describing the price outlook as, quote, constructive. I'd say it's constructive. We're going over $100 a barrel next year. S&P Global Platts and out. Analytics sees oil demand growing 4.7 million barrels a day next year to average 103 million barrels a day, some 700,000 barrels a day above pre-pandemic levels. Well, there you have it. Um, it's kind of baked in the cake now. Uh, I've been talking about this for a while um, during the depths of the pandemic when the uh, 
lockdowns happened, I said, get ready. Eventually, we're going to have an oil crisis. This is going to help precipitate an oil crisis. You know, we were buying. I, I, I told you guys, I gave you a free one. You can go back and look. I know there's some guys on here that did it because I've gotten the emails. I remember talking about Athabasca Oil Sands Corp at 14 cents a share. I think it was $1.20 today. That's over a 10 bagger. Uh, Eric Nuttall was on BNN, our favorite Martian, our favorite energy analyst in Canada, the guy that was the last of the Mohicans having to take the stairs instead of the elevator during the depths of the of the uh, lockdown. He was the last man standing. Everybody was laughing at him. Now his fund has swelled to record uh, uh, inflows, and I think he's up uh, hundreds of percent. So, um, you know, he was talking about Athabasca, I think, on BNN today at $80 a barrel average price for oil uh, next year, the stock could go in his mind to 270 a share. That's more than a double from here. So um, this is what happens um, in this type of environment. And I'll talk some more about that uh, later on in the presentation. But if you were an Athabasca guy, like we put that out as a free pick, you got a 10 bagger. So Blackstone, this is another big, big money manager, says we are facing an energy crisis. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take any victory laps, but you know, it's interesting. You know, if you're if subscriber to Actionable Intelligence Alert, you were way ahead of all the big hedge hedgies. You know, we had to wait a little bit. You had to be a little patient, but it, you know, the, we skated to where the puck was going to be. Now everybody's, we've got the puck, taking our shot on goal, and everybody's skating over to us. So uh, very interesting. I don't want to take a victory lap. I don't want to get too cocky or get too proud, but we called it, folks. And uh, now we got everybody uh, is coming to our side of the canoe, which makes me a bit nervous, by the way. But anyhow, Blackstone Inc. co-founder Steven Schwartzman said the world is facing energy so shortages so severe they could cause social unrest. Uh, very possible. Quote, we're going to end up with a real shortage of energy. Yes, we are. He said at a conference in Saudi Arabia, and when you have a shortage, it's just going to cost more, and it's probably going to cost a lot more. And when that happens, you're going to get very unhappy people around the world, in the emerging markets in particular. Yes, in the United States, too, and there's going to be a regime change and a massive turnover in Congress next year. Uh, when you have you know gasoline at $5 a gallon, not just in California, but in the whole country. Quote, inflation, we are in a new regime, said Fink, chairman of BlackRock, the world's biggest asset manager. Quote, there are many structural reasons for that. Short-term policy related to environmentalism in terms of restricting supply of hydrocarbons has created energy inflation, and we are going to be living with that for some time. Indeed, we talked about it. We talked about the exact reasons, and now we have the world's largest asset manager, echoing what we've been talking about for a year. I hope you got positioned because if you've been looking at the Q3 earnings results of many of these oil producers, they've been outstanding. Pioneer CEO, Biden should back off anti-oil policies. President Joe Biden should back off domestic oil drillers rather than pleading with OPEC to pump more crude as U.S. gasoline prices climb, according to one of America's biggest shale explorers. Biden has repeatedly called on OPEC and allied oil exporters to increase supplies as fuel prices surge at home, infuriating a shale industry threatened with strict limits on where and how it drills. Sheffield's rebuke came the day, the same day that the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, and aligned crude producers dismissed out of hand Biden's request for an acceleration in supply increases. I've talked about this before. They're not capable, I think, in many cases to raise production. This is a thesis, I think, that has not gotten mainstream yet. And when it does, I think you really, that's when you could have a real big move in crude prices. I don't think the world that, you know, the thesis, Josh Young over at Bison Interests, he's been talking about this. Um, we've been talking about it a little bit, uh, but uh, this thesis now is starting to gain traction or the view Eric Nuttall talked about it. He's been talking about it and it comes back down to the lack of investment in an extractive industry. This is like 101 stuff. And we, we saw that with the collapse of the oil price 
the collapse in or the shrinking of cash flows, the ability of the companies to recycle cash into new projects. They simply weren't able to do it for many years. And now you're in a situation where you have a vital commodity that uh, is in going to be in short supply. Now, I believe with the proper price incentives for a sustained period of time that you will get uh, additional crude production and you'll solve the problem. This is what always happens. You have a boom bust cycle. So this is not like something you, you know, buy oil stocks and then go to sleep for 10 years. Uh, that's not how this works. You have a window of opportunity. You have to be positioned when these things are low. That's why you have to buy these things when nobody wants them. That's how you get the five and 10 baggers that we've already gotten and that we're looking at more. And let's talk about some of the results. I talked about last month's email or last week's email that I send out uh, to my email list. And if you want to get on that email list for those uh, free emails, once a week, I send out a free email to the subscriber list. Um, for people that are interested, you can go into the show notes and see that. Um, I talked about Suncor's earnings and the what they talked about doing, the, the cash flow projections at certain oil prices. And, you know, they're, they're raised, they've doubled the dividend, they've uh, increased the buyback, and they've talked about um, their debt reduction plans. And they've forecasted out, you know, I think it's something around six or eight billion dollars in cash flow. And we saw similar results from Devon this week. Um, they had a huge earnings, uh, you know, the report, quarterly report, same thing. Talked about what? Big buyback of shares, right? Paying down debt. Um, all the way down the line, Synovus, um, any company you can think of. You know, um, even Athabasca I talked about, they're not going to buy back shares, but it's about debt reduction. You know, and we've got shares in the, in the portfolio of other mid cap or smaller cap oil and gas producers in Canada, you know, you know, that's why we went to Canada. You know, the overall oil and gas industry was beaten down, but Canada was, the shares there were just like abandoned. Like I, I talked about Eric Nuttall, you know, he was, he kept the faith. He was the last guy man standing. And he kept saying, you know, when this thing turns and it's going to turn, these things are so decimated, the re possible returns are gonna be multi, multi baggers. And that's what we're starting to see now. And even in the large caps, you're seeing some pretty decent moves, you know, CNQ, Canadian Natural Resources, you know, Suncor breaking out. And every time the, these companies are announcing this, these, these, these huge earnings reports and these huge tsunamis of cash flow and the fact that they're buying back shares, you're getting huge re-ratings all across the board by analysts. The generalist investors are now coming back. So it's a tremendous opportunity. The opportunity is slipping away. It's, if you're not in, you got to get in. But, uh, you know, um, this, is, this is an example of what we do. We look for bombed out, beaten up industries, companies uh, left for dead that have a potential catalyst for a re-rating. We're looking to see something go from terrible to just less terrible. And that can be a substantial re-rating in a stock price. We don't need, you know, something that's down 90%, uh, we don't need it to go all the way back up, you know, goes up uh, down 80%, that's a double, right? So, um, or I have to check my math on that, but you get the point, okay? Um, and that's what we're looking for. But you got to have that catalyst and it has to make sense and it has to have a time frame on it. So uh, it's not as easy as folks think, but, you know, people can call it luck. People can call it what they like. What am I looking at now? Well, there's parts of the oil and gas industry that, um, you know, it's like a pig moving through a python. Where have we not seen a lot of the prices react? Oil services as the price stays here or goes higher, the cash flows will eventually, you're going to have to be go into more production. So you, then you start having to spend for seismic, you start having to spend for rigs, you start having to spend for drilling fluids and geologists and this type of stuff. So um, at some point, the larger cash flows, because it is an extractive industry and the companies will eventually start recycling cash into additional production, to replace produced uh, produced reserves, uh, we will see that. And those stocks haven't moved yet, so uh, for the most part. And so that represents tremendous opportunity there also. There's, uh, there's fields to be plowed in that uh, part of the business. So uh, we're definitely looking at that also. So 
So as we talked about, this is what I want to talk about, like the SPR. So China, about a month or so ago, talked uh, talked about releasing a bunch of crude, not only crude, but copper, a bunch of, of commodities from their national stocks to try to cool the prices because we were starting to get a runaway commodities market. I mean, we were, we were seeing copper at 480, oil was pushing 85, $86 a barrel. And so the Chinese came out and said, you know, we're going to release this and that will have a temporary effect. But, you know, at some point you have to buy the stuff back and that's what we're seeing, right? Uh, here's uh, Alexander Stahel. We like uh, following him on Twitter. We covered this last week. China's low crude stock will require substantial buying in the coming weeks and months. Uh, China may be forced, as a Bloomberg article, China may be forced to start buying crude at elevated prices to replenish its thinning crude supplies or stockpiles, adding more pressure to a nation that's facing energy shortage and seeking to avert a diesel crisis. So that was uh, Sunday, October 31st, last, last Sunday. So you see, you can temporarily manipulate, you can temporarily do things in the market for political reasons, but in the end, um, economics is economics. And so we get to the end here because uh, uh, kind of piggybacking on some other things I've talked about. I really did do a, I did a pretty, not an extensive, but I did do a write up on ag prices and ways to play it in this month's, the November issue of the actionable intelligence alert, which just went out today. You know, one of the things I, I, I'm having a hard time. There's, there are investments, there are ways to take advantage of this. Um, higher food prices, uh, but I didn't. I don't see a lot of five and ten baggers in some of the things I was looking at. Do I have investments in agricultural stocks? Yes, I do. Am I looking for more? Yes, I am. Am I trying to do some private equity things? Yes, I am. I'm trying. I look at all kinds of things. You know, I have uh, a little bit more resources than the average investor, retail investor. I'm an accredited investor, so I look at other deals. I look to get involved in actual farmland purchases, but uh, this isn't for the average investor. So I'm trying to find uh, things that trade in the equity markets that a person could buy to take advantage of what we see here. So this is the CEO of Yara which is a very large fertilizer producer. They make a lot of nitrogen fertilizer. And I didn't have time to find this article because I had to get this uh, video out, but you can go look it up. Uh, he says that I'm afraid we're going to have a food crisis. The energy crunch has made fertilizer too expensive to produce, says Yara CEO. So I'm gonna go look this article up. It was uh, in Fortune Magazine. Hopefully it uh, can be, be found online. But this is what we've been talking about, right? We said that fuel equals food and that uh, at some point, uh, you know, one of the things I wrote about in the article, in the uh, commentary for the newsletter this month, November, was the threshold. The UN has a food index. It tracks food prices around the world. And the food index uh, has a threshold where in the past, if prices get high enough, you start seeing political turmoil and chaos particularly in emerging markets. We saw that in the so-called Arab Spring, I think back in 2011. Um, it, that really wasn't about democracy. That was about food prices. You need to understand that, and you probably don't think about this, but in emerging markets where people's incomes are not as high, they spend a disproportionate amount of their money on fuel and food. And in some places you could be spending, you know, the majority of your money on food. So if food prices go up 40%, which they have this year, according to the UN, this can really affect your life drastically. You know, if your food bill here, if you're knocking down 50 or hundred grand a year, whatever you're making out there, I don't know what your salary is. And you know, the price of eggs doubles, you're not gonna stop eating eggs, right? I mean, if they go from $2 to $4 a carton or whatever, that, whatever it is. Um, it's not going to kill you. You might not uh, be buying New York strips at, you know, two or three in a pack for 30 bucks, but, uh, you know, you're not going to starve either. You're talking about people actually on the verge of starvation because of these food price increases. So um, you couple this with the weather that I think the adverse weather, you know, we've been blessed in the last decade, at least with very, very benevolent weather that has led to or helped lead to uh, very, very large harvests and very, very large carryovers of grain stocks. And I would suggest to you that we're going to see the beginning of that 
reverse uh, for the reasons that I've talked about before. And so I think you're going to have a lot of things coming together to really make this a very, um, well, let's say interesting decade. Uh, I do think we're going to have inflation uh, that's going to be a lot higher than people think, and we're going to have a lot of turmoil in this world. And so I would suggest to you that uh, you have to be nimble, you have to be educated, you have to really pay attention to the way things are. And we have too many people, I'm going to get on the soapbox, but we have too many people that look at things the way they want them to be. And that is a recipe for really getting your butt kicked. Um, there's the way we want things to be, and then there's the way they are. And when you're talking about what I think is going to be happening, there's going to be a lot of turmoil, I think, because of the uh, policies that have been pursued, uh, because of the debt that we're in in the Western countries, because of changes possibly in weather, and just uh, some of the bad policy decisions. Plus, we have the emergence of a potential new superpower in the world or a country that wants to be a superpower that is starting to flex its muscles around the world. And we have a empire, i.e. the United States, which seems to be in relative decline. So I would suggest to you that we have a lot of things to think about and a lot of things to consider and that things aren't as simple and uh, as easy as they, you may seem to think they are. So again, um, we remain bullish on energy, tremendously bullish. Things are, you know, I was talking to someone and they said, well, you know, I hate to be taking advantage. I'm not taking advantage of this, you know, it's going to be investors and speculators that get us out of this. It's going to be people with capital that can come in and solve these problems. Okay, the government's not going to solve these problems by releasing 30 million barrels from the SPR. Okay, that's not an infinite amount of oil. They're, they're, not going to, they're not going to solve it by building more windmills and stuff. They're not going to solve it by putting wage and price controls in. All they're going to do is make things worse. And uh, I would suggest to you that uh, your responsibility, number one, is to your own family and your own kind. You have no responsibility or as a regular person to try to solve the problems of the entire country or world. You did not create them. It's not your responsibility. You should earn as much money as you can uh, with these markets. This is my intents. What does it do? It frees up your time. It allows you to take care of people uh, around you that you care about and to uh, hopefully alleviate uh, people's pain and suffering uh, in, in some small matter, if you so choose. So um, that's what the goal is here, is to get people to hopefully make, make a few bucks. I feel pretty privileged because I've had quite a few people write to me, at least over the last year. Uh, maybe it's because of luck. You know, some people would rather be lucky than good. But uh, some people with um, changing their views and getting them to uh, allocate money to some of the things we've been talking about over the last year, year and a half, some people listening to this have had their lives changed. They've, they've made tremendous amounts of money and it's been material to their life and giving them some choices that they didn't have before. So I feel pretty good about that. I'm going to keep doing this and uh, hopefully that uh, we'll hear some more success stories like that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. We thank you. Uh, we appreciate you. And uh, I want to get this out. I'm doing it uh, nine o'clock at night on a Friday. It will come out Saturday morning. Uh, it seems uh, I do have a pretty good audience. People were emailing me. I had to work late last Saturday. I didn't put the thing uh, out, the video out on time. And people were wondering if I had quit, if I had disappeared uh, or, or what had happened. So uh, appreciate that. And we'll try to stay on the schedule. All right, guys, that's it for this week, and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thank you.